right, so has anybody written down any questions? All right. Um, Come on so, up, Ian. <laughs> yeah, can we get two comfortable chairs up there? Um, that's a nice one, but I want it to be equal. I don't want, you know. Oh, no. How about if we stand? <laughs> You can see. You can see. You want to put it at the table. Um, huh? And there are two microphones. Yeah. Okay, I'll go grab the yeah. mic. You can each handle one. Um, do, I mean, if there aren't that many, I'm torn. I wanted to be able to. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not a sir. I'm just Kevin. I, I, I've got a relatively open-ended, um, more of a thought than. Got to be multiple choice. <laughs> Okay, A, I'm right, B, you're right, C, none of us are right. C. <laughs> so, right. D. All the above. So, so, so I'm sympathetic to the, to the concept of the cohort, right? And so when I, when I hear you speak, and when I, when I hear Ian speak, the, the challenge we have with the cohort is it's too large, right? The, the grain size is too large. And a lot of people want to say that the ideal cohort is a cohort of one, that, that we teach every child where that child is and where that child wants to go. But virtually none of the models that are at least conceivably achievable in my lifetime can get to a cohort of one. There's right? a premise that you just said, so I, and I, I just want you to recognize that you just stated a, a premise in your question, which we right. may or may not agree on. So, so okay. the other premise is that the reason we have big cohorts is because we're mainstreaming all these kids. So instead of trying for a homogeneous class, right, we have we have excelling learners and, and delayed learners or slower learners in with average learners and there's this premise that the smart kids are going to help teach the, the, the slower kids and, and that's actually going to accelerate the whole thing along. My premise is that that hasn't worked. So I guess, you know, where where do we think we see in the greater New Hampshire scheme of things, where, where, do we, where do we think we need to be in a public school model? Because most of these people are, are tied to the public school. You know, I, I, I just, I'd like some, some insights given those sort of extremes on that cohort concept. Uh, okay, so I, um, I appreciate the question and I would tell you it is the right question when you're trying to exit a cohort mentality, right? In other words, I guess if, you've, if you're thinking all the time, cohort model, cohort model, what is the right grain size? Can I get down to a right grain size? What you're doing is you're starting from the system and trying to see how do I plug those students into that existing system. So I would start with the students as curious learners and say, how do I connect up to them along that path of their growth as opposed to how do I plug them into your existing structure that you have. I would tell you I think that Learn Everywhere is an opportunity to begin the process of an N of one uh, that doesn't cost your communities any funding because really what you're doing is leveraging your entire community in that process. It's not a program that the school has to do that you have to go set up. What I'm telling you is that this learning is taking place all around you now and the question is, it is an end size of one because this student can try this thing, this student can try this thing. And so it has to become, I think, more student-centric and you will be able to shift away from trying to continue to manage that system. And then uh, let me just talk to you about how does that system then move? And, and this is part of Learn Everywhere, right? We're trying to move a system, again, since 2005, 2011, 2012. You know, if you, if you study kind of disrupting systems, um, it's not easy, whether it's in education or in, you know, you get a huge corporation, very large corporation, you're trying to move it into the future. Um, generally, any kind of an idea that happens, uh, ask everybody who worked at DEC, um, <laughs> just gets, uh, you know, absorbed into the, the premises that you hold about the system and they get borged and they get destroyed, they get eaten alive, right? Generally, the way that the changes actually happen, I think I'm standing too close to this mic. Um, 
is that you have something outside, maybe that's a learn everywhere, right? And it begins to move forward, and so then what you can do is you can move that system over, that's how you're gonna move that system. That, and so it is non-destructive disruption is what it is, uh, to allow the system to go to a new place as it embraces a new premise, because almost by necessity it will have to as it sees kind of its participants migrate in this direction. <coughs> Kind of a theoretical, philosophical. <laughs> I'm taking control now. Um, so, Joe, write down your question, please. Um, so, first, one of the questions that I got is, can I get a copy of Ian's presentation? Um, and the answer is, it's going to be posted. Skip when? As soon as I can. As soon as Skip can, like, you know, in a year from now, probably. No, uh, just kidding. He's really busy. So we're gonna we're gonna be patient, but it's gonna be up on the SDGA website. Um, a under couple this of days. Seminar soon. Um, so that's for everybody to know, uh, and Frank's too, by the way. Even though the question was just about Ian's. <laughs> he won my presentation. There you go. Here we go. <laughs> Take a picture of it. It's yours. <laughs> Um, so then we have some questions um, that I was really hoping that there'd be some overlap. Um, I'd actually like to answer Kevin's question. Yeah, he wants Oh, you didn't even get there. I apologize. Yeah, sure. okay. Everybody that's so fast by Frank's answer. Um, I mean, I, I agree with him, um, but I would say that when I, I don't know if they even have this anymore, but when I was a kid, we had a thing called independent study, right? You basically demonstrated that you were able to teach yourself, you know, here's your math book, go off and do this. Here's your English book, here's your history book, go off and do that. That is a cohort of one. I think also, again, if you, if you are still in that model and you haven't broken free, you haven't broken out of the matrix yet, um, you have things like Montessori where a kid is in one cohort for math and then he goes to a different cohort for science and he goes to a different cohort. So you don't have to have those groups be such an identity. It can be, you know, you, you can break the cohorts up by what you're doing, because some kids are ahead in here and behind in there. Um, the third thing is, I think one of the things that happens, there's a school, I think it's Grinnell College in Iowa, which does a great thing, I think. Instead of saying, you're gonna take five courses this semester, and it's gonna last 16 weeks, and you're gonna have all this stuff you're trying to learn in parallel, they're like, hey, Let's do this course for three weeks. And that's all you're doing, right? So you actually can get people sort of up to speed. And the problem with the cohort is you haven't got everybody at the same level, right? If you could just pound everybody into the same shape, then the cohort work model works fine. It's just that they're starting at different places. If you can get people to the point and you have small units of what you're doing, then it can work not as well as we would like, but I, I think there are ways to do that without blowing up the whole model, if that's uh, not feasible. Non-destructive so. disruption. Thank you. Okay. Non-destructive disruption. Yes. It's too I, I just, let me just throw one. I just want to throw one more thought out there, and it's it's only tangentially related to this, but it is dealing with the cohorts. When I, and I, when I reflect on you know, because sometimes I look at it, I'm like, well, think about colleges. I mean, colleges are kind of cohorts, right? Um, so if you imagine, though, I have a five-year-old and the potential that there could be almost up to a year of difference in terms of the age, I mean, that's like 20% of the kid's life and his development. You know, by the time you're 20, now I'm down at 5% of the kid's life, right? So, you know, as individuals mature, so that variance, like the standard deviation in terms of maturity and performance capacity and everything else is far greater younger and it begins to center a little bit as you get older. There's still the individuality, but I don't think you have the degree of standard deviation at that point in time. I think this is a quick question. Who administers Learn Everywhere? Uh, so this is basically a program, and again, this is in the Q&A, but uh, basically these programs would be vetted or qualified at the Department of Education. We've got a guy named Dr. Nate Green, and I'm using the charter school process to do this. So essentially, if somebody wants to teach a program or offer a program, it, really what I'm doing is I'm unbundling education, right? So today, I credential educators, or the, the State Board of Education does. The State Board of Education authorizes schools, right? Every public school in here is authorized by the State Board of Education. This is an unbundling of education. If you can authorize a school, why can't you authorize part of a school, like just a program or something like that? And so that would happen at the department level. We would do the administrative parts of it, and just like a charter school, somebody fills out an application, says, I want to teach math. 
I want to teach engineering, I want to teach robotics, whatever it is you're going to teach, uh, leading to the minimum standards, they would fill out their application, they come before the State Board of Education and say, here's why I want to be, you know, I want to teach an arts program, and the State Board of Education either believes them or doesn't believe them and says, go forth and teach. Uh, I would just add, the, so we agree on, I, I think kids should learn everywhere. Um, there is, if you're talking about bundling, the two things that are bundled, almost metastasized are school and daycare. And so one of the reasons you want to bring the future into school is because parents are looking, if you, take, if you took that away and just said, you know what, you, you have to handle your kids, you have to figure out where they're going to be and make sure they're not going to get into trouble, that's a huge thing that everybody is looking for that benefit. So I see it as, yes, at first, the kids are there, and they're there because everybody wants, the parents want them there, and so you bring it in first. But then you can have Learn Everywhere Within. The, the, the vision that I was presenting, the daycare vision, is basically they, are, they can get that learning from any online source. They can get together. They can teach each other. They can do whatever. It's not that you have to go through this course and get this grade from this teacher. It's that you figure out what's going to work for you. There's a whole world full of resources and you demonstrate that you've learned something and then you're done. So you can learn everywhere inside of school too, but only if you break down some of those barriers. But I think it's a huge mistake to, to talk about this stuff without talking about daycare. Because that is one of the major functions of school right now. And to pretend that it, I, I think, is it, it's, it's what, you know, what you might call a premise. The premise is the kids will be there. And we know where they are. It's physical control. It's incarceration. We need to know where they are and what they're not doing. So. So what, I mean, and so I, I understand what you're saying, particularly at the younger levels, but I'll tell you that most of our high schools, and I don't know if we could do a survey here, most of the high schools are open campus. So you've got, you know, because at a certain age, kids have some agency, and we want them to have that agency, and so you've got students in high school who are coming and going. So there are a number of questions about solutions to the stuff that both of you talked about, and I'm going to throw out some of the ideas. Isn't homeschooling model the answer? Um, how do we get, how do we produce, in quotes, teachers who are capable to teach for the future? <laughs> can we get the building out of education? Um, can we convince towns and those who make education decision, decisions about this idea? And how do we get the message out that we need parents to partner with, it says education, but I think they mean schools, uh, to give our kids basic skills and so on? <laughs> it's the solution, right? Well, I think, I'm going to guess, I'm going to model Frank here. I, I think he would say, there is no solution. He just told you that like 12 times. There is no the solution. So if you're looking for the solution, you're already, you've lost. You're on the wrong path. So I don't know that there is a solution. I, you know, the model I have for things is I'm hoping that you can actually get through programs like the ones he's talking about, a generation of students who can then go back and teach their parents. Right, <laughs> how to be good citizens and how to think through things and how to solve problems. I don't think you necessarily set up schools for parents because they're going to have the same problems you have with schools for kids. So I think you know involving them is. I don't know that you can teach that. And so this is the thing that Jody and I. She's an educational researcher, and a lot of educational research is is very interesting. That it's it's develop it's pointed at how do we take teachers and teach them to teach kids. And it's like, you know, if you can make it simple enough for the kids to use, you know, you can sort of leave the teachers out of it because they should be at least as bright as the kids and they should be able to use those things, right? Um, so I think it, the kids are where you have to aim. Um, so yeah, I, I just don't think there's a solution. I think there are lots of solutions. The world is constantly developing new solutions. And mostly what you have to do is allow those things to happen. You know, it, it, again, it's less about making something happen or forcing something to happen or you know, slicing up the world a certain way. The world is advancing incredibly quickly. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff all you really need to do in many cases. If you can get the kids started in the right directions, get the hell out of the way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? No, I'm good. There's a lot. I mean, I'm happy to kill them off. <laughs> Okay.